I think we can probably get started here. Uh, just let people kind of trickle in. Um, but I just wanted to welcome everybody to our online full-on series presentation. I'm very happy to see um, so many of you signed on tonight to hear from our presenters. And I want to welcome you tonight on behalf of the McDowell Foundation. The foundation funds teacher-led research in the province, such as the projects you're about to hear uh, tonight. And again, very, very happy that you've joined us. Um, I would like to start by acknowledging that I'm on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional lands of the Cree, Soto, Dene, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and homeland of the Métis. I appreciate and honor the relationships with one another that allow us to share this land and continue to work con towards reconciliation. I know that we have people joining us from other territories, and I would hope that you would take a minute to consider your own relationship with the land and the people who live, work, and play there. I would now like to introduce Melissa Gerlach, president of the Regina Public Schools Teachers Association, to bring greetings. Thanks, Nicole. My name is Melissa Gerlach, and I'm president of the Regina Public School Teachers Association. I live, work, and learn on Treaty 4 territory, and I'm constantly discovering and learning more about how the TRC calls to action can be responded to by our leadership. On behalf of the RPSDA, I am honored to be here tonight to congratulate Brett, Tamara, and Brian, and all of the wonderful partners that they were able to work with on this project. I know that you were able to connect with Indigenous students in the four different pathways that they asked you to consider in your research and that you were able to connect with them more personally through the Growing Young Movers or GYM program that runs out of Scott Collegiate here in Regina. I look forward to hearing more about your journey tonight and thank you very much for inviting me. Thanks, Melissa. So before I turn it over to the researchers, I just wanna quickly go through some um, technical things before we get started. Uh, there will be a portion um, at the end for questions um, and answers. Um, we invite you to use the raise your hand feature to speak where we can turn on your mic if preferred. Um, you can also ask questions through the chat um, as well. We will be recording tonight's session for those who were unable to attend and it will be available on the McDowell website. Uh, Jay from the STF has kindly joined us to offer technical support. So thank you for joining us there. I would now like to invite the researchers to first introduce themselves and then share their work. Once they're done presenting, we'll move into that question and answer period. So I will turn it over to the research team. Hi folks, uh, my name is Brian Lewis. So I'm a teacher here at Scott Collegiate in Regina. Um, I'll just leave it at that. We're gonna get into ourselves a little bit more as we get going, but I'll turn it over to my colleagues that have joined me tonight. I'll jump next. I'm Michael Dubnowick. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Regina in the Faculty of Kinesiology and Health Studies, and I'll also keep it short to start. Yeah, uh, good evening, everyone. It's nice to see so many of you uh, online tonight. My name is Tristan Hopper, um, also an assistant professor in the Faculty of Kinesiology and Health Studies uh, here at the University of Regina. So I am going to share uh, my screen just so we, we're, we're going to work through a PowerPoint just to uh, keep us on task and to keep us uh, running smoothly. So if you could bear with me for a moment, I am going to do that and then we'll get uh, underway. Um, so I'll just start. Um, I'm going to say like. It's a little different always teaching at night. Like I'd never teach at night, but to have everyone here. Um, and however you're coming to this, whether you have a tea at your hand, a coffee at hand, uh, water, I just had some sugar beforehand, so try and add some enjoyment with this. Um, but I also do want to say one of the things as we started this, um, for the three of us presenting here, we're in Treaty 4 lands. And one of the big things we think about is just becoming relationally accountable in our work. And what that means for us individually as we get to live alongside youth and how important that is to be accountable to their lives. But also one of the things that it pushes us also to think about is just our institutions too, that we have responsibilities for ourselves, but for the institutions we're part of to make some of those shifts so that they become accountable as we're part of them too. So I think that's a big beginning for us. All right, um, thanks, Michael. We would be remiss of course tonight if we didn't acknowledge and um, highlight all of the amazing contributions of our 
of the other research team members who uh, couldn't join us tonight. So Tamara Ryba and Brett Cannonberg, who were both teachers at Scott Collegiate at the time of engaging in this project. Uh, Sean Lassard, who's a faculty member in education at the University of Alberta, and Joseph Netauhau, who is an ongoing, um, uh, a longtime friend and a guide for the Growing Young Movers and a traditional knowledge keeper based in Saskatoon, I believe. So we we thank Joseph for all of his his um, sharings and guidance as we uh, worked through this project as a team. Thanks, Tristan. So um, I'm just going to take a minute to share a little bit of background and context with regards to the leadership pathway at Scott and uh, Growing Young Movers. Um, there are four pathways at Scott, and the leadership pathway is one of those four. So um, students within that pathway take electives um, that are kind of geared to opportunities to showcase leadership. And I'll leave it at that because um, what we did in past post um, research study is uh, the young folks that work with, alongside us in the pathway and with GYM really wanted to showcase what we were doing and they did that through a video creation um there's no better way to share a little bit of context on this pathway and how the partnership with growing young movers works than to sh share this video so if if you wouldn't uh if you would uh sit back and, and just engage with this video for the next five minutes it, it was done and created by the 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 high school students within the pathway uh, with support from uh, uh, some phenomenal technicians, let's put it that way. So I will uh, begin the video now. Yep. Dance. The dumb scat now. Umuto Mamoyatetem. Welcome to the Mamoyatetem Center, home to Scott Collegiate's Leadership Pathway and Growing Young Movers. Through these doors, you'll see a vibrant generation, strong sense of community. Hi, I'm Kyra. And I'm Tamisha. And we are grade 12 students here at Scott Collegiate. And mentors within GYM. We're super excited to show the work we do in our amazing community. Oh, come. So what is the leadership pathway? The Leadership Pathway is designed around eight elective courses that provide opportunities for us as high school youth to build upon our strengths as leaders. Our Pathway provides an opportunity for us to showcase our skills. I feel our Pathway is unique because it's built on our experiences. The Leadership Pathway is not limited to a specific skill. It focuses on an idea and a mindset you can carry with you through life no matter what profession you choose. At times, we are in the classroom, and many times, our classroom looks like this. Through movement and connecting to the out of doors, we are able to enhance the leadership qualities we all possess. Our pathway puts us in positions of leadership, allowing us to expand on the skills we have. When the bell rings to end the day, the hands-on work continues with growing young movers, or what we like to call GYM. GYM is a nonprofit organization that serves the youth of Regina by providing after school mentorship programming for youth 6 to 14 years old. We as leadership students have the opportunity to be employed with GYM in a youth mentorship role. The skills we gain during the school day are utilized in GYM after school programs and vice versa. As mentors, we are doing far more than gaining a paycheck, we are impacting the youth within our community. GYM is all about community and building relationships in a safe space. Youth have a welcoming place where they feel included and receive guidance and support from us as high school mentors. In GYM, we learn a lot about ourselves and get to practice skills that help us navigate life. 
The youth come to know us and see us as role models. We see our younger selves in the kids we work with, so it's empowering to be there for them and make sure they always go home with a smile on their face. Yeah, when I think of uh, GYM, I think this is a safe and sacred space. You know, and, and, uh, that's what I feel when, when GYM started. Young people uh, all of a sudden found a home and found a place to that had heart, you know, and it had also people that they could trust. That's a big thing. I love my community and I love watching the kids grow. I love giving back to the community I grew up in. This work has motivated me to continue my education, having recently been accepted to University of British Columbia. The pathway continues to gain momentum, and Growing Young Movers works diligently to find more opportunities for these young leaders to showcase their talents. The mentors, as part of the GYM family, are impacting hundreds of youth each year. We, as an organization, continue to grow. We continue to move with more and more youth, not only within our community of North Central, but throughout Regina. We are moving for change. What is it that we are moving to change? Perceptions of Indigenous youth. Perceptions of the North Central community. Graduation rates. The employability of youth the number of opportunities for us as young people to showcase our strength. A stump you watch go away. Move with us. A stump you begin. Grow with us. So uh, we'll touch a bit on, again, my apologies, I had to shut my computer right down. I don't know what happened, but uh, we're, we're going to touch a bit on the methods piece here now. Um, Michael, do you want to take this part? There we go. Yeah. Um, I think when we were starting this project, one of the most important things, like when Brian and Tristan and myself, we started sitting down. Um, our beginning points, we were always kind of thinking about how can we understand the youth lives a little better. And we knew that was always, it's often a tension when we're in school places and other places. Um, so like our, one of our first beginning points and one of the things that we always came back to when we started this work was just hanging out at Growing Young Movers. And this was, I think, one of the biggest parts that started everything of how we even engaged with the work. Um, and we have here narrative inquiry alongside but our beginnings were really just playing alongside so that we could actually take some time to say like we were trying to get to know the youth in different ways when we actually just played with them at after school places and so that was one of our very most important beginning things of saying we had to be together um, to have that point um, for everyone just as a little background like academically narrative inquiry we tend to come from it that we say people live storied lives and we're trying to become attentive to that um, and so that was kind of our starting points academically when we thought, what was a narrative inquiry? It's this purposeful attentive to, attentiveness um, to how people experience the world in which they're navigating. And part of that was coming alongside 10 Indigenous high school students who were part of Growing Young Movers. Um, so should I keep continuing? Does anyone want to slow me or should I start this one too? No, just okay. you can go through these if you want. Okay. Um, and one of the places we started when we had Tamara, we had Brett, we had myself, Tristan, we had Brian, we had Sean Lassard zooming in, we had Joseph coming in on the certain occasional days when we could all sit down together. One of our first starting points that we began with was really these autobiographical or reflexive inquiries. Basically, we we're all sitting down to get to know each other, of sharing our own stories of school sharing our own stories of physical education, what it meant to be a leader, some of the negotiations we had in our life, um, so that we had a community as a research team together, um, so that we got to know each other in certain ways. And there was a couple reasons why we did that. It was one, so that we had that community together, so that when we sat down with youth, um, and we'd all sit down with two or three, that we could actually talk to each other and have that relationship where we could be open with each other of how the conversations went, 
But there was also the big point when we started this autobiographical part was we didn't want to basically overlay our stories or our understandings when we were listening. So then we could kind of slow down each other and say like, oh, um, are we overlaying what we think or our own stories of physical education, leadership, any of those other aspects onto the lives of the youth we were working with? And so as we went about it, we had a lot of reiterative and collaborative conversations where we just kept coming back as a research group to have conversations after we'd sit down with the youth. Every time we'd just come back together, we'd share like all these ideas, thoughts and counts um, before we came up with more points to say, where else could we take the conversation so that we could hear better? And as we did that, we sat down several times with each of the youth. Sometimes I think it was four, with others it was five or six in different occasions. And then after we had sat down over all those occasions with the youth, we wrote narrative accounts. And so these are basically story deep experiences of how we got to know the youth. And some of these were larger documents up to like 20 pages. And we sat down again as a research team, shared them with each other and also shared them with the youth as a way of saying, did we listen to you well? Um, did we take time to get to know you and hear how you were experiencing growing young movers in the school landscape so that we could learn from you in many ways to make these places fit your lives? Um, so the sharing of accounts was a very big process for us. And then lastly, it came to this last point when we were kind of coming together and we were thinking across all the youth lives of to pull threads. Um, things that we were thinking about as the youth shared them with us that we could kind of summarize down in little ways so that we could have some touch points without trying to reduce the youth lives. Um, so we'll go from that point now and then have conversations after. So I'll pass it over to Tristan uh, just to kind of start it off and then we'll jump back. Great, thanks, Michael. Yeah, so as Michael uh outlined, we worked collaboratively to, to uh, unravel some of the key threads within each of our, our narratives. And, and as a group, we came up with, with three key sort of findings or three common threads that the youth were asking us to consider as, as a part of our narratives. And so that first one is this idea of the leadership pathway, creating a pathway or uh, an avenue for the youth to uh, create an identity, and so uh, I'll read a, I'll read a quote quickly from one of the youth or one of the narratives from one of the youth quickly here. But um, the youth really asked us to consider how the uh, leadership pathway was a an initiative or a place where they began to to see or to story their identities in in other ways other than you know an indigenous youth who lives in North Central but in ways that saw them as, as leaders or becoming a leader, as a teacher, and sometimes as a brother or even a role model. And so one of the, one of the youth that I had uh, the great privilege of living alongside as a part of this project said to me in one of our conversations, follow the fo uh, follower to a leader, dot, 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 I guess back then my grandparents and my mom thought that I was going to be a follower, right? Because I was always effing up through people I was following. And as I got older, that changed a lot. I don't know. I never used to call myself a leader until I joined Brian's class because like, I don't know. I'm just like, I don't feel like leading, I guess. But when there's little kids that are looking up to you within Growing Young Movers, I guess, I guess you would consider yourself a leader. And so those those threads sort of were very prevalent in this particular um, this particular finding in this idea of identity making or or the leadership pathway creating space for the youth to begin um, creating identities outside of perhaps what um, they would have traditionally taken up. So I'll pass it over to Brian to to spear spear the next finding. Yeah, thanks, Tristan. Um, a second finding that came of, of our work was this notion of a pathways for play as educative. Um, I can't tell you how many times in the years I've been doing this that young people have said to me how 
play is such an important part of their role as as the mentor in there and that it bring gives them an opportunity to be a kid again and it allows them to de-stress and forget about a lot of the things that they carry with them to school every day um and just lets them you know gives them a, a, a way to cope um so how we play in those spaces is quite different than what a lot of the young people that have worked with us have experienced through physical education or any recreation or sport that they maybe have grown up with. Um, the second part to, to this notion of play as educative is, is rethinking how we structure play. And um, again, going back to them sharing some experiences of what physical education was, what school was where it's competitive it's I don't want to be you know made fun of I don't want to be put on the spot I don't want the attention to be on me and how it's completely reversed in the way we play alongside the young ones where it's not about competence and skill as much as it is about care and respect so that was a another finding that they cert the, the young people certainly wanted us to uh to think about as we move forward and I'll uh, pass the last finding over to Michael. I'll try and be quick with this one, but I think this is one of the most important things that we kind of learned throughout this process and living alongside the youth. And I think this is one of those aspects when we have this pathways in the sense of recognizing youth as knowledge holders, normally this is very much a bumping point for people in education of in many ways, it's a positioning that we always have to look at the people we're working with, that youth and schools as people to be taught. And there's very rarely spaces to say, okay, they come to these places with knowledge, they have knowledge and they show knowledge all the time. Um, but sometimes just our structuring of our relationships, we don't get to see that a lot. And so one of the beautiful things of getting to play with them at Growing Young Movers, and when we had conversations with them, was it was a place where they weren't being taught and they weren't being the ones who were being taught, but they were actually being the teachers in those places. And when they got to work with little ones that I remember one of the youth that I work with, he always said it was a place where he got to represent himself in this way that he actually got to show his knowledge in those places where it felt so much different than something when we heard and we sat alongside many of them saying in classrooms, we don't get to know ourselves as knowledge holders because we're not positioned in those ways. And so it was very much a different structuring when we were talking about growing young movers and we got to live alongside them, to the structuring of them as co-facilitators, um, teachers alongside little ones in the community, and actually being able to show that knowledge and not being a place to teach them to be leaders. So I think that was one of the most important things that was taken from this process. And so I'll kind of pass it along there for as we go yeah. through these last points. Thanks, Michael. So uh, again, we'll we'll tie things up here shortly. Um, just thinking about our forward-looking stories, if I could just share a little where we are now. Um, we did have a, a we were going to talk a little bit more about some of these pathways for action, but they maybe they'll come out in just this little wrap up. But um, so as we maybe didn't acknowledge, um, we started this research, I want to get this right, in um, in the fall of 2020. So we were in COVID um, big time when we were doing this. We had to pause school at times, we had to pause GYM at times, and we had to pause our research at times. So we, we stretched this out over, uh, well, probably about a year, a school year and a half. Um, bring us forward to now, um, we have over 40 young people that work with us from grade 10, 11, and 12 at Scott. We have employees that have graduated from Scott that uh, continue to work with GYM in other um, realms. Um, of all the young people that have ever worked with us, we're graduating uh, students that have worked with GYM at a rate of about 87%, um, which is phenomenal. Uh, considering what the the averages uh, from the province are right now, and we all know that more work needs to be done to to have uh, more people see success in school. So we were we really think about how it can maybe look different, how students maybe can 
make a bit of an income while they are attending school and be acknowledged for all the work that they do. Um, just real quick, that's a recent photo of some of our grade 11s and 12s at work. I, I couldn't not show uh, some of the, the brilliant faces that are a part of our group that obviously are at home, maybe doing homework or probably not, but that's okay. Um, and just the, the partnership between our Regina Public Schools and their support of the work, because as a nonprofit, there's a lot of gray and it makes school look very different, but it's, we believe it's working. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to Tristan and Michael, but thank you for having us. My apologies again for whatever happened with my video part, but we made it through it. And I, I, uh, I thank you all for, for attending tonight and I'll turn it over to Tristan or Michael. I know like um, as Brian's talking about what's like everything is still ongoing in these ways and I think that was one of the great parts of this project um, that it wasn't like this small project that we saw with like confined boundaries. Um, a lot of these relationships are still in the process of just continuing to be built and I know as we lived alongside youth I know for within my own research it's a lot of those wonders too because when I was getting to know a lot of them at Growing Young Movers one of the things I loved was there are these transition points that you saw with high school youth and little ones. Uh, there's a supporting of a relationship from elementary to high school to imagine themselves there. And it was one of the things I absolutely loved because it was a transition in relationship. But it also helped me think about even in those places within school systems, like I'm very much positioned at university places, that we don't think about those transitions of relationship as well. Um, but it helps me think about that a lot more of how do you have relationships that are built and maintained so when people find their ways, maybe it is to university, maybe it's somewhere else, um, but there is a relational web that exists, much like how the little ones and the high school youth are doing. Yeah, I think I would echo some of the those similar uh, sentiments from Brian and Michael. I, I, as I sort of began, uh, working on this particular project and creating a relationship with Brian and the youth at Growing Young Movers. Um, uh, I always try and position my work as as with and alongside the young people that I work with, but um, the stories and the, the knowledge and the expertise that these young people carry with them is, is um, extremely profound and um, have the great privilege and excitement to to continue working with with some grade uh, 12 students now on a research project and um it's just it's um uh just a great great privilege and honor and um it's always it's always a fun time at, at gym i think we're good nicole thank you perfect well, thank you very much for sharing that presentation and the amazing work that your team was able to carry out. Uh, we will now move into the question and um, answer portion of the evening. So as I mentioned earlier, if you have a question that you would like the research team to answer, uh, please raise your hand and uh, Jay will unmute you. You can also send them in the chat if you're not um, comfortable raising your hand and, and sharing them uh, verbally. Um, so I'll give uh, you a few I think I got muted there. Was I muted the whole time or did it happen? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, I will um, turn it over now to the audience to ask any questions. Um, while we're waiting for some questions to come in uh, to get us rolling here. Um, I always find research like this very interesting. And I know like oftentimes when we go into research, we kind of have, um, kind of those little beliefs that we think or what we think the experience will be like. Um, so I was just curious, is there anything that you learned during this project that maybe kind of surprised you or changed your initial thinking about uh, your research topic? Um, I probably wouldn't start it during COVID, but that's, everyone can say that. Um, actually, the, the thing that I think it showed the resolve of those, the young ones, and I'm just speaking on behalf of all of us, but um, yeah, it didn't slow them down or their their want and their desire uh, to be a part of it. I thought that was that was a bit of a, an eye opener for me at the start, just how how into it they were and how 
how much they enjoyed every time we could all come together or come together one-on-one. -on -one. That came out in other ways. Um, for those that maybe know what a following their voices school is, um, where we are one of those schools. Um, and a number of the, of the young ones really appreciate the fact that people were taking a lot of time in their mind to allow them to share. Um, they, they, they mentioned that sometimes if it's a survey or if it's just a, a short fill out this thing to let us hear what you have to say, they didn't find that um, as welcoming, I guess, as what we were ended up doing alongside them. So, and, and the last thing I'd say is I think we probably learned more than obviously anyone. They taught us so much, um, made me a better teacher, made me a better parent, everything, just going through that process. So. You want to finish, Michael, before we get to that? Okay, I'll quick finish. Yeah, I think as Brian was saying, the amount of commitment, um, and I know like one of the big surprises that I often had was like, sometimes when we have conversations of the community we work with, I remember I'd step into conversations with colleagues and they'd ask like, oh, that must be really hard work. Or that must be like really difficult to kind of get the youth to sit down. Um, the amount of commitment the youth had to just and this might be just the process in which we engaged with it, um, was very much we always wanted to come together. And that was, I think that was one of the most enjoyable processes I've ever had in like research and in communities to say, when we saw each other, it was like, we just see like our little groupings navigating together after we've had conversations. Um, and it'd be like a wanting to sit down further. And I think that was one of the most open processes I've ever been part of. Um, and I think that was probably a testament just to the sense of the ways in which we engaged in multiple ways, where it wasn't just like, hi, I'm sitting down, um, here's a pen and paper, and here's a recorder. But we spent a lot of time getting to know each other, and I think that made this a lot more um, complex in the way that we could build relationships, and thus what we could understand of each other, um, which I don't think would have been possible if that time wasn't taken. Um, Brian, there are some questions um, from Leah about, uh, do you see them? What are the eight courses in the pathway? Are they all Saskatchewan credits? Are any of them special credits? And are the students cohorted? I think you'll be best to answer that one. You don't want to take that one, Tristan? No, I'm kidding. So I can uh, take a stab at it, but. <laughs> hi, Leah. Um, so some there's eight, yeah, eight courses. There's physical education, 20 and 30. There's outdoor education, outdoor leadership, um, leadership, 20 and 30, cultural arts, and, and oh my gosh, uh, uh, life transitions, I believe, is the other one. So uh, basically the pathways work that most of their electives are within that pathway so if they chose in grade nine to start grade 10 in the leadership pathway those would be their elective courses through 10 11 and 12 so they are cohorted in a sense that um, every school year uh, there's a semester where they're with their leadership pathway uh, colleagues I guess in um, two classes so we kind of group it it's usually their afternoons. So right now, for example, uh, all the 11s and 12s are uh, together as uh, getting their their two credits each. Um, and then the 12s are together last, second semester as well. So I hope that answered your questions. I do have another question um, that I can ask here um, to give some people time to, to type in their questions. Um, so, um, what kind of advice would you give another teacher or school or organization that's looking to do kind of a similar, uh, program or project? Like, what did you learn from it? Um, what would you maybe change other than not doing it during COVID? <laughs> I, I don't know if it's advice. I, though, I think we have to just try to think outside of a box of what we've always known school to be. Um, if we look at you know how it's working for a number of people in our province it's we can say it's it really isn't but we continue to try to keep it the same way as opposed to thinking what school could how it could look different um you know the idea of 
bringing in the nonprofit piece to work with school as partners is a way of, I believe, thinking outside of the box and thinking of a different way of making school work. Um, the, obviously, this this study helped us understand more how the young ones experienced it, and it has informed how it's moved forward from those years to where we are now. So, yeah, just we try to not be confined by how high school has always looked. Um, like we're lucky to have the center where we're surrounded by four elementary schools. We try to get elementary schools in during the, the class time as much as we can. So in our leadership classes, our high school kids are alongside the little ones in the neighboring feeder schools. Um, because again, we're trying to, get them to imagine this is their high school. So just that would be the only thing I could think of right now is just thinking what could look different, like with, you know, instead of just the uh, bell rings at 8.30 and ends at three, what could what can be done a little differently? There's a question, Brian, from Jane, and um, probably best to, to tackle this one too, in terms of, um, research process findings, what do you believe are the significant lessons for teachers who want to improve their practice and supporting student leadership? That's a sure. good question. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Jane. Honestly, my first reaction is it's how you position the young people. If you position them as you're going to teach them to be a leader, then we're already starting from a deficit model, I believe. So when people say to me, I like Michael said earlier, like that must be hard, or I see people you know, in passing outside of work and I, they know what I do for work and it's like, oh, you're teaching them to be leaders. And no, I, that's not what we're doing. So that would be the big lesson. I, I think going through this study helped reiterate what I thought I already maybe knew about the young people I did know. And it really uh, strengthened uh, how I believe we need to position young people in the way they see themselves, but when they come to school, they can't be themselves, if that makes sense. So, um, yeah, just not coming in as I'm going to teach them all how to be a leader. I'm just hoping to give them opportunities to showcase the innate skills they all have. They all grew up with from family, from community places. So that would that's a significant uh, lesson for teachers, I would I would assume. Yeah, I would say that would be one of my uh, biggest takeaways, too, in relation to this question is um, at least the, the two young people that I uh, I worked alongside on this project already, like as Brian alluded to, already saw or could see themselves as a leader in many parts of their life and certainly sort of in their in their school sort of school realm as they transition into a mentor or a leader within growing young movers that sort of that might shift or that identity shifts but certainly when they leave the the center or the school building too they they storied and and identified and saw themselves as leaders you know they have little they have younger siblings that they care for at home and and those kinds of things and so um I never got the sense from my conversations with the with the two that I worked alongside and Brian and Michael, you could probably agree with this. Never felt they never sort of alluded to the fact that like you needed to teach them to be a leader or that, you know, they wanted me to tell them what I meant by leadership. They they already they already were leaders and they just um needed a space like growing young movers in the pathway to, to sort of flush that out. Is that an accurate sort of yeah, Michael, I don't know if you have anything to yeah, add to that. Yeah, I'll add in a, like another way, and I think this is kind of like building off all these things, especially like from the place of like trying to reimagine how schools can be. Um, like I'm not a teacher in school places. I'm a partner to someone who is, and I've been part of school places a lot. But I think one of the places we often turn even at universities is we want the people we work with in classrooms um, to be like responsible to curriculum or no curriculum. And thus, if they know that, then it's our place of saying, okay, they'll know that so that they can be better, whether it's leaders, people in math, people in science, in any of those areas. Um, I think one of the things, even in some of our findings, was in, 
the youth in many ways asks us like think about what we're responsible to is it something like curriculum and making sure that's hit in those very like distinguished ways to say like do you know something to saying like can we make schools a little more responsible to something like their community because if we can make school and the activities we do them responsible to their communities then we're almost becoming more responsible to their lives because that's when we got to see the kids and the, like the youth in the communities the children in the communities being like well we're actually this is our community this is where we are wanting to be responsible to and we can actually show all our knowledge around that too um, so I think when we can try and turn it from saying what we're being responsible to do as teachers isn't so much like content always first, I'll be, that's very important, but to like the communities in which their lives are part of and the content helps in a way get there, then I think there's a lot of openings and I think you um, got to see that a little bit differently in growing at Movers too, because it was a responsibility to the community, to the kids who were around them what they were creating there. Excellent. I noticed that there were a couple of questions in the chat as well. Um, so Ellen was curious if you could speak at all to the impact on the program um, on like the younger children involved. Um, how did they respond to the youth and what kind of difference did the program make for them beyond the aftercare? I think Brian's typing an answer in the other in the other box, but do you want to tackle that one too? The impact on the little ones guy that freezes everything up is multitasking right now hey <laughs> um sorry I, I did see and you know what before I answer that I just want to put a shout out to Ellen because Ellen was the one who answered my numerous questions at the time when she was in that role with uh the McDowell Foundation so thank you Ellen uh for all the work you did uh supporting our work so um curious to speak to the impact of the program I, I mean, it's one of those things that it probably is hard to quantify in some ways, but, but I just know when I stand at the door at the end of the day, when we have 10 high school mentors waiting in our center and the kids walk in that space day after day after day, knowing the mentors by name, seeing them outside of school on the streets, telling their family, hey, look at there's a GYM mentor. Um, there's a profound impact that, you know, we, we all agree as researchers, we want to do more work out as far as talking with the younger ones who come to the programming. Um, so, yeah, what kind of difference does the program make for them beyond the aftercare? I, I honestly hope, and I believe it is, it's helping encourage young people to get through elementary school and come here for high school. Uh, we've seen that we've had little ones that were participants that are now mentors in our program because, um, you know, time does go by. This is our 11th year of offering this um, fifth year as part of a pathway. But GYM as an after school program, mentorship program has been around for 11 years now. So um, I hope that helps a little. And then I, I just reading the question after, was there a second piece? Um yeah, yeah I, a second question. It's, yeah, it's just it's impact. I, I honestly believe it's it's impacting families, it's impacting the young ones. It's you know what that I'm pretty proud of is that um we also have a traveling road show, call it what you want, um, where our mentors go and work with young ones in other community schools in Regina Public Schools. So uh, those young ones go home and say, hey, we had growing young movers at our school. Oh, how did it go? And they can explain that Scott Collegiate students were there working alongside them, which is shifting a narrative that's been all in this city way too long about what Scott Collegiate is and what, um, you know, what, what the narrative is around young Indigenous people. Um, so we're, we're shifting that. Um, I know that permeates throughout the community when we go to places or young ones go home and tell their family, or we walk them to the car and say goodbye or introduce them, those mentors introduce themselves to the parent picking up the little one. So there's just uh, an ending, uh, I believe, impact. Um, but it still comes back to the youth where we believe what this is doing is it's it's creating a community where they want to be and want to, they feel they belong, 
and that sense of belonging. You know, when we do studies or we do surveys provincially and we ask, you know, Indigenous youth or just youth in general to say, how many of you feel you belong in school? And less than half of them say they do. That's a problem that we need to, to shift, right? So um, I could go on and on. I talk too much, but thanks. Um, I'll quickly reiterate. I think that's one of the things, like when you get to talk with like the little children there, like those imaginative belongings of someone, like being able to imagine themselves in a place before they're even going there. I think that's a very important thing to say within communities that like, you can imagine yourself as a student at Scott because you've been there for five years playing with a friend. And so like your knowing of yourself at Scott and you get, you watch little kids with like the biggest smile on their faces who are like doing cartwheels, making little forts. Um, their knowing of themselves in that place is very much from like a place of strength and a playfulness um, and of people inviting them there every single day. And I think that's a really important thing that kind of, it doesn't leave in that sense. So that when people are thinking where to go in those next places, they're kind of already there. Um, they've been welcomed before. And I think that's one of the most powerful things I've ever seen with little ones and the older youth there too. Denise has found a, a link to the publication on the McDowell website. So she shared that in the question of answer. I can also put it in the chat um, later. Um, but yeah, are there any other questions for our research team here tonight? Well, if there are no other questions, um, I can kind of move on here. No, that's me. Okay. <laughs> it's more information if anyone wants to. <laughs> it's always so hard to like uh, keep up with both. <laughs> it's like that multitasking, right? Um, well, perfect. Um, I do want to just take some time to, to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Um, the mission of the McDowell Foundation is enriching teaching and learning by supporting professionally led research that supports teachers such as these here tonight to ask questions about themselves, their schools and their professions. And that's why we're here. Uh, we are pleased to have been able to provide the space for these conversations. And uh, we hope that they continue into staff rooms, coffee shops, uh, boardrooms and all places where decisions and discussions around education are occurring. So thank you to Brian, Michael and Tristan for sharing your knowledge and experience. And thank you, Jay, uh, for making sure that everything happened and for helping us through those tech um, issues. The McDowell Foundation is able to exist because, because we believe in the professionalism of teachers and of the need to ensure that good research comes from all of us, not just external places and spaces. Thank you to our many donors, including the STF, who are um, able to, in, uh, that allow us to ensure that teacher voice and teacher experience continues to lead this conversation. So for more information on any of the McDowell projects or to donate to the foundation, please visit our website, um, which I will put in the chat. Uh, thank you again for joining us tonight and I hope you have a great uh, evening and the rest of the night. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank, thank you. you.